the last week's celebration of all things Scotch we're taking you, but the global tour tonight. Um, and it's so awesome to have you here. I'm gonna bring Andy in. Let's say hello and good evening to Andy. Oh, hi there, how are you doing? Hello, it's been a while. A bit of a while, two weeks exactly, I think you'll find. Two weeks, hello everybody. <laughs> How are we all doing tonight? I hope we're all doing well. And I gather that we've got a load of brand new subscribers, which is also incredibly exciting. So if your box looks like this, and you've got your super size pour and sip welcome pack, then welcome, welcome, welcome aboard. It's great to have you. Hello to the pour and sip party for you guys. Hello, pour and sippers, they are now known as. Pour and sippers, it's official. Um, but don't worry, you're just as welcome if you've got our regular box through the post. Um, you've still got your tasting notes, still got your all important drams. So yeah, tonight we're gonna be tasting Mars and then we're gonna be tasting Amrit. So if you're not quite ready, grab your drams, grab some, some tasting glasses, grab some water, you'll probably need that. Um, I'm gonna get a game just shortly, but how's your week been, Andy? What's happening? As I, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm moving house at the moment and this whiskey behind me is the last thing before I do, it's the last thing to go into boxes. I'm trying to work out a way to kind of take them to the next place without breaking any, which would be a tragedy. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I'm moving house on Monday, so it's kind of all a bit of a mess at the moment. And um, but once it's done, it's done. I cannot wait. <laughs> what about yourself, Christy? Yeah, all good here. I mean, I'm just about to attempt to decorate, so I'm also reducing the number of samples and, and drams everywhere, but you've probably done a better job. Them. No, no. Well, hmm. It's a really tricky one. I don't know about you guys, but I find with, with drams, I would say, obviously sip, don't go first of all, but don't keep them for too long because once the oxygen gets to them, they sort of lose their luster a bit. So yeah, definitely drink them all within sort of the first few weeks of having them. Like don't save them too long or, you know, this is what I'm finding with some of mine. They're definitely past their best. It's the same with bottles as well. I think once I get beyond that halfway point, I start to panic and I start to go, oh, this is going to start to, you know, you depends on the age of the whiskey. The older the whiskey I tend, it's going to take longer before it, but the peated ones, especially the heavily peated ones, they go very quickly once they've made past that halfway halfway point. So it's, uh, yeah, it's it's a, all a game. Indeed. Evening, hello whiskey drinkers, Andrew Bowley. Evening. Oh yes, evening Andrew, and evening Chris as well. He says whiskey from India, who, who knew? Well, we all will know now, and we'll all know even more about it by the end of this evening. Yeah, India and Japan tonight, after having been in Scotland last week for uh, the three Scottish distilleries and now in India and Japan, it just shows how kind of where whiskey's going at the moment, really. It's just what is next? What is next? Well, you can make whiskey literally anywhere in the world, right? I think like, we've got all these kind of like preconceptions about how scotch is best or it's only good if it's bourbon, if you love bourbon or, you know, Japanese whiskey is like, you know, the, the best whiskey ever. But actually, you can make really good whiskey anywhere in the world. Um, and as we've learned, we've had whiskey from yeah. New Zealand already, whiskey from Finland, whiskey from everywhere. Well, I mean, Finnish whiskey, who were new, and that's one of my favourite things I've tried so far on the uh, Pour and Sips. It's absolutely stunning drought. So it yeah. really does go to show. It's exciting. Yeah. So, so good. And as always, like the most fun part of our pour and sip tastings are when we hear from you guys. So you're tasting along. Please let us know what you think of the drams. Put your tasting notes in there. There are no wrong answers. Obviously, we've got your tasting note cards. You can put your notes on the back. But yeah, the most important thing is get involved. Let us know what you think. Join the chatter. Um, yeah, it's super exciting. We're a community. That's the whole point here. We're a community. I'm just laughing at Adam Pounds, who couldn't resist. Already tried half of each. <laughs> <laughs> I like it, I like it. Uh, hopefully that means they're good drams. So yeah, you've had a chance to perfect your tasting notes in advance, That's it, which yeah. I like. That's exactly okay. it. So I just thought we probably haven't actually introduced ourselves. So my name's Christy. Um, I work with Master of Malt, which powers pour and sip. And this is Andy, AKA London Whiskey Guy. If you haven't come across him before, check him out on Instagram. Impossible. You must have come across me if you're on Instagram. It's impossible <laughs> not to. <laughs> Must have done. But without any further ado, shall we kick off with the first dram? Like, hopefully we've got everyone bored now, everyone's ready, everyone's salivating to get involved. Yes, I am. Perfect. So we are going to kick off proceedings with Mars. I really struggled to say this, I don't know why. Mars Maltage Cosmo. It feels like a tongue twister. Mars Maltage Cosmo. And I'm just going to pour it, we'll have a little chat about it. So this whiskey is so interesting for me for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, if you exist in the whiskey social media world, the Twitter sphere in particular, then you probably would not have missed the news this week that um, the big Japanese trade association for spirits and liqueurs makers, so literally... Well, I've got to go there right now, Japan Spirits and Liqueurs Maker Association. Um, they kind of released some definitions this week around um, Japanese whiskey. So um, 
just a bit of a backstory. Japanese whiskey has become super popular. People are loving Japanese whiskey. Um, it only really kicked off like less than 100 years ago in Japan. Um, obviously, there's a really rich history of distilling other spirits, so particularly like maybe fruit brandies and shochu and things like this. And yeah, really, really exciting. Loads of deliciousness. But um, yeah, Japanese whiskey came along. And for, let's say, 90 years, maybe, maybe slightly less, um, it was largely drunk in Japan. Um, but then the rest of us got word of how great the stuff was and we started hoovering it up. Um, exports grew and there was a supply and demand issue. Um, in Scotch whiskey in particular, there's a real culture of like sharing casks. So if you run out of like 15 year old spirit, no problem, you'll just buy something from someone else or swap some casks or, you know, sort it all out. Um, that doesn't really happen in Japan for a whole number of reasons. So um, what they started doing um, and some producers were super transparent about this. Um, Mars is one of them. They've always said that they do this. It's not a problem. Um, they started buying in perhaps Scotch or Canadian whiskey to sort of add to their stocks, particularly for some of these younger distilleries. Um, and I want to stress at this point that if a Japanese producer is blending their Japan-made liquid um, with something from Scotch or Canada, it does not automatically make it bad. You have plenty of good whiskies that are doing this. Um, the issue has been around that transparency piece. So do you know what you're buying? Do you know that it's kind of like a Japanese Scotch blend, which is what we've got right here? Or are you buying something that you think is like a single malt from one distillery in Japan and actually it's a blended malt? And that's what this week um, the association decided to kind of try and crack down on a little bit. Um, and they introduced some rules around what you can call Japanese whiskey and what you can call whiskies from Japan which sounds like not much of a differentiation, but it's actually quite a big deal. And we'll talk about it a little bit more after we've had a taste, but just to kind of frame that, this is one that um, is a blend, it's a blended malt. It's um, made at, I'm gonna pronounce this wrong as well possibly, the Shinshu Distillery. Um, and this is right up in the Japanese Alps. It's an absolutely gorgeous place. It's on my travel bucket list. As soon as we can get out in the world again, I'm heading to Japan and I'm going to this distillery. Um, it's, I'm gonna again pronounce it wrong, like I, I don't speak Japanese, but Nagano, the Nagano Winter Olympics, like all of that sort of part of the world. And he's nodding his head. Um, Fluent it's in about, Japanese, so yeah. You were correct. You were right. Perfect. I like it. Um, yeah, so this is about 150 miles west of Tokyo, um, right up in the mountains, gorgeous clear skies, which is how this whiskey got its name. It's named after its environment. And it's actually, if not the highest whiskey distillery in the world, it's one of them. It's like 800 meters above sea level. It's a really spectacular environment. And they, I think they mature a lot of the stuff up there as well at altitude to kind of like play around, have like, you know, not that much humidity, um, see what effect that has on, on the whiskey. So the stuff that they produce there is aged there. And yeah, they're really cool. Um, I was trying to like sniff around and get some more information about like the size and shape of the stills and I couldn't find very much at all. From what I understand, they've got two stills there. It's not that big a setup. Um, but what is interesting about its history, it was founded in like 1985, so it's relatively new. But then because, you know, there wasn't that much demand for Japanese whiskey for a while, they mothballed it. Um, from I think 1992 all the way till 2011 and it only kick-started operations again in 2012 so they haven't got much stock like what are you supposed to do people suddenly want this amazing liquid so that's where you get into the blending piece um, so yeah really fascinating I think this it's really good timing to be tasting the Stram now this week I think so yeah I think I've spoken too much Shall we have a nose of it yeah there's a lot of people who've already got their notes already yeah. there Straight off the mark. Let's uh, let's have a nose of it first, and then we'll get to your comments, and we'll just see what we think of it first. Oh, I'm loving this. Do you know what I'm really getting first on the nose, and what I got when I tasted it again earlier? Are these cereal notes? It's proper malt. This is Malty. without a doubt a blended malt. It's really shining through. Love um, cereal grains, you know. Um, but I, I get loads of like sweet pastry kind of notes, and kind of sweet mm -hmm. bready kinds of notes as well, like hints of kind of soft fruits as well, which are really nice, but raspberry as well and apple that kind of green apple and raspberry which is really nice yeah 100 percent. i put down green apple like really crisp green apple um also pears it makes me think strangely of like a british orchard i actually wrote pe poached pears as mine as well of tasting notes as well like poached pears as a dessert you know um which i get at christmas time it's not a christmas tradition but it's always i always have it at christmas then um but yeah it's really nice what about you guys green tea is green as always very smooth and subtle nose almost floral and delicate Bob Byers, really nice nose, definitely getting strawberry. Mm. The carrots, some banana, Anna Dillon, yes to the strawberry. Uh, you guys are chatting with each other. You guys don't need that. You're chatting with each other. You're agreeing with each other. 
Jacob's Island, bananas and strawberry laces, David Stanton, honey and toffee. Yeah, I mean, we're all getting those kind of really fruity kinds of notes from this. It's really gorgeous. It's kind of making me think of like old school sweet shop vibes too, like rhubarb and custard, boiled yeah. sweets kind of thing. It's really, really tasty. Yeah, um, it's 43%, cool. so it's fairly, like fairly approachable. Um, the dram we've got next is much higher ABV, but that's fun. Um, Ooh, Ian Jambo's question, sorry, quickly, is any clues on which Scottish distilleries are involved? And all Japanese distilleries are extremely secretive anyway, and it's very unlikely that any distillery would disclose. Um, and, well, I don't want to open the can, but we'll talk about this at the end when it comes to the, the Japanese and the Scottish whiskey and sharing and kind of transporting, exporting and uh, malted barley and stuff like that. I mean, my guess might be Port Ellen, but I could be wrong. Um, Port just, Ellen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, of course it's Port Ellen. Of course it is. Um, yeah, I mean, I think if you want to get super geeky, you can look at like... Um, um, and if you can read Japanese also helps, you can look at um, like company records and stuff and see who's shipping in bulk and where it's all going um but yeah it's, it's not stuff that's generally in the public domain but i think yeah. if you really wanted to find out you could do some googling um yeah. which is really interesting a good one to look at if you want to get into this whole rabbit hole and minefield which is quite interesting is um scotch whiskey association exports so they talk a lot about um sort of where bulk scotch is going um and some of it will go to places like india and some of it will go to places like japan as we now know um so yeah, that's really interesting too. I don't know about you guys, but I'm getting a tiny whisper of smoke maybe on this now. Yeah. Maybe um it's like a tobacco y ashy kind of smoke as well. Mm -hmm. Really, really subtle. Like it's 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 not kind of coming straight out of the glass. It's really something you kind of need to pick out for me um and think about it. For sure. Time for a taste, I think. All of this yeah. chat. Yeah. <laughs> Christy, Let's... we're talking to it. We just haven't tried it yet. Come on. Know, cheers, cheers, everyone. everyone. Mm. it's so smooth for me really mouth filling and it's got like a really gentle pepperiness of texture but um it definitely doesn't disrupt that smoothness that mouth filling vibe really lovely lovely oily texture kind of balance between like this kind of sweet and spicy kind of peppery gingery kind of spice and on the finish the things lingering for me is like a tobacco kind of leaves kind of ashy kinds of smoke maybe um, but it's lovely sweetness, like I said, those orchard fruits, kind of the green apple you were talking about. It's really wonderful, smooth, smooth dram. Absolutely. Definitely. I'm getting like milk chocolate vibes too coming through. Yeah. Um, I think maybe that's partly to do with the texture because it is quite oily. But yeah, it's yeah. like um, yeah, like a galaxy bar, which I love. Oh, it's making me quite easter now. We're not, not going to ask everyone now which their favourite chocolate bars are to I go know. with. I feel I actually had dinner before the live this evening because last time it just got too much. If anyone was on the live, we just got, went down a cheese and whiskey pairing rabbit hole, and at the end of it, I was like, I'm so hungry, I can't cope. So we'll try and avoid that this time. <laughs> El Sutton, definitely a sherry cask in there. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, again, it's one of these things that isn't disclosed, but I think bourbon and sherry casks are for sure used at this distillery. Um, and yeah, there's, I think there's an influence. There's, the Japanese, especially Japanese businesses, they have been, they are always very secretive about what goes into their blends. They never disclose this kind of information as you might get, especially in America or, I mean, in Scotland. But, um, I mean, it, this is where now they might have to be a bit more transparent than they may have been in the past. Mm. Um, Edgy sure. Marshall getting pineapple and honey with brioche on the nose. The sherry sure. tasting oily of the tongue, Andrew Bowley, Michael Smith, hint of tiramisu, strangely. <laughs> yeah, I mean, absolutely. It's a lovely dessert. Ian Jambo Rain, beginning to get a bit of the citrus now. It's been in the glass for a while. Chris May, I agree with the cinder toffee as it goes on. Nigel Gang, taste the smokiness on the tongue. Very smooth. Tiramisu, Angela Dillon, yes. Sean McCarrick, oak and tannic dryness on finish. So, yeah, some awesome tasting notes there from everybody. Yeah, keep them coming in. I really love it. Um, yeah, and I think actually talking about sort of the secretiveness and what goes into whiskey, this is where for me whiskey tasting is its most fun because we can kind of be like detectives, right? It's like, well, what has gone on with this spirit? Um, and when we do um, sort of one of my side jobs at work is um, WFCT level two training, which is so much fun and getting people to kind of understand how you can sort of perceive aromas and flavor and getting people to understand that they can tell the difference between whiskeys. It's so exciting. Um, and yeah, I, I quite often say it's like we're detectives. So we're nosing it. It's like, is there oak influence? Yes, clearly this whiskey has been aged in, in wood. Um, 
has can you taste the raw materials well that's like the cereal notes yes of course we can um and then people saying that i think there's a sherry cask influence like all of these little clues that we get from our nose and our palate it's just help big up like build up this picture of a whiskey and i just think it's incredible that we can do that i see we're playing detectives at the moment that's the great thing about it uh, penny wooster's asking now can you pair whiskey with chocolate mm -hmm. oh, absolutely yeah. you definitely can um jeff is it true that the distillery is based on a volcano and if you fly in by gyrocopter then <laughs> they'll try and shoot <laughs> you down i mean i hope not i know that it's up a mountain i guess it could well be some sort of volcano i feel like i wouldn't build my distillery with my precious casks on an active volcano but it's definitely yeah. mountainous um yeah. i think it's like what did i say 800 meters above sea level or something so yeah, yeah. it's at altitude i mean i don't want to test that theory though i quite want to live to taste whiskey another day i see i mean sorry that milkiness the, the kind of milk chocolate vibes you're going is really coming out now. the longer it sits in the glass the creamy chocolate is lovely yeah for sure while we are having another little taste i just wanted to circle back to some of the new rules i say rules um for japanese whiskey because i think they're really interesting and i really want to get people's thoughts on them and your thoughts as well andy so i made a little note so i wouldn't forget anything and actually as i dug into them I kind of considered that they were maybe more like Irish whiskey regulations and scotch. And I'll tell you why in a second. So the new rule. So, so obviously this product is allowed. Um, we know it's a blend of Japanese and scotch, but this would now be whiskey from Japan rather than Japanese whiskey. So to be called Japanese whiskey, our rules, um, malted barley must be used. You can use other ones as well, but it has to be in there. Um, water from Japan helpful if you're distilling that. Um, it's going to be fermented and distilled and kind of like a handful of other things, basically the whole process in Japan, your raw material processing, all of that. Um, it's got to be distilled. This is where we get a bit geeky, but stay with us. Um, you can use different types of stills, but you can't distill it to a higher ABV than 95%. Technical terms, like obviously that does a lot, but it just means you get a lot of flavor still in there, which is good. Um, here is where I am fascinated and I want your thoughts. Um, it has to be aged for a minimum of three years, so far so as you'd expect, but um, it has to be aged in wood. It doesn't specify oak, which is what makes me think more about Irish whiskey. Um, and the maximum size of those uh, containers is 700 litres. So with scotch, it has to be oak, but in Ireland, we see things like chestnut being used, all kinds of other things. So actually, I think we could get some really interesting flavours coming from this new Japanese whiskey category. And then bottled in Japan, minimum 40%, and you can add caramel color if you want. But it's that piece about the maturation that really fascinates me. Absolutely, I mean, I, when I saw this, I think, I just think it's a really interesting thing because it's what are, the labeling for me is gonna be what is the most interesting thing. And as a consumer, I was not dumbfounded, but when I saw that Nika from the Barrel, for example, which a lot of people, me included, would say is my favorite Japanese whiskey, suddenly find out that it isn't, well, they can't call it Japanese whiskey anymore, um, is, um, oh, are you still there with me, Christy? You just, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know, because you, yeah, you I'm, froze, I'm I didn't know if it was my thoughtfully listening, thoughtfully <laughs> listening. Uh, <a> <laughs> Nika from the Barrow has been one of my favorite Japanese whiskeys for a long time, but um, obviously it's likely that they've been using Ben Nevis because it's owned by Nika, so this is the problem. This was never disclosed, ever. Yeah. And so I, unless you were in kind of malt circles, really, and kind of in, you know, kind of really researching that. Um, so I just think it's really interesting what they're going to put on those labels. Now, it is worth stressing as well that this isn't law as it currently stands. Yeah. This is more of, I would say, a gentleman's agreement kind of thing at this current point in time. Um, so there will be, it, can, it might be open to, let's say, interpretation of what you can put on the label. Um, what they're gonna write made in Japan, I'm not sure. Jap Jap I mean, it, it, it's we'll wait and see really what they're gonna put on the label. So stuff like the Nika Days, if you've ever tried that blended whiskey or the Nika from the barrel, um, or this one in particular that we're trying now, which has Scottish uh, more in it. So really interesting to see what's gonna happen. There. Yeah. A couple of other points of note, and I, and I completely agree with you on that. Um, Obviously, it's not legally binding. It's only the association's members that have agreed to abide by this. Um, all the big producers are. Um, so all of the big names that you would know are. Um, but there are some smaller producers that we stock a master of malt that you can get in the UK who aren't members. So what will they do? Will they just not disclose? Like, that's interesting. Um, and also, um, these rules have been announced, but they are going to start from the 1st of April this year, but they don't, they're not going to be kind of like enforced by the group or, you know, they've got three years grace. So it's going to be the 1st of April, 2024, from that point that it's like really considered a thing. Um, 
But yeah, it's so interesting to me. All the Scottish distilleries that might rely a bit on those kinds of exports in Japan, what does it mean for those guys and their kinds of trade? So these are all kind of aspects that are going to play a part in these decisions that have happened from the Japanese um, associations. It is interesting what's going to happen past yeah. that deadline day. Definitely. I'd love to know what you guys think as well. Like, does this change your perception of some whiskies or do you not care? So for me personally, as long as it tastes delicious and the producer is being transparent about it, I literally don't care. Like, I, this whiskey is a joy to sip on and drink. Um, I think the producers have done a really great job with it. It's really well made. It's really well blended. It makes no odds to me enjoying this that some of it was distilled in Scotland and some of it was in Japan. I know that, and I knew that when I bought the bottle, so that's fine. Um, would you feel differently if you discovered that after you'd already bought it? Like, let us know your thing. This is the thing I'm saying, and I know Ian Jambo Rain here saying he loves Nika from the barrel, but it's that thing of like finding out afterwards. Here it's disclosed. We all know, you know, if you, it only takes the basic bit of research online to mm. find out that there is Scottish malt used in this kind in this blend that we're drinking now. But Nika from the Barrel doesn't has never really disclosed that information, um, so it is interesting to see. However, a lot of people who buy Nika from Barrel, even though it's a fantastic whiskey, is sold in supermarkets. How much do people in supermarkets necessarily care? Like you said, the main thing for them is does this taste good when I drink it? Not where is it? Where has this been sourced from? It has to be all from Japan. But it's it's going to be really really interesting. Uh, Peter Gold uh, is. Uh, Jeff, I have a bottle of Burmese whiskey that's blended under the same conditions I, as the Japanese variety. Sounds amazing. I want to know more about that, Jeff. Like, yeah, slide into yes. the DM. Let us know because that sounds fascinating. Hunan um, lost count of the bottles of Nika I've had. Lovely drop. That's exactly it. It is an amazing drop. If we're talking about Nika from the barrel, it is a wonderful, wonderful dram. And I think it, I've always said it's a great gateway into Japanese whiskey. And I can't even say that. Uh, it's a gateway into whiskey that's uh, been bottled in Japan. Um, Anna Dillon, pecan nuts with this would be great. Uh, Rob Besser, never realised there were such strict rules. Not sure if I, it will affect my enjoyment of it. Um, and Alistair saying, if I like it, I'll buy it. This doesn't do it for me, but I like and buy the Nika blends. That's exactly it. The most, as you were saying, the most important thing is, does this affect my enjoyment of the product at the end of the day? That is the real main thing. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the other side effect, which I will just finish up saying this before we move on to the second whiskey, um, is it going to make uh, Japanese whiskey? as opposed to whiskies from Japan, so we're going on the rules bit here, is it gonna make them even more expensive and inaccessible to like to us? That's kind of what I care about as well. When I first got into whiskey, let's say eight, eight years ago, nine years ago, um, it was really affordable to drink age statement Japanese whiskies. I think I remember buying like 12 year old, 18 year old age statements for under a hundred pounds. And then, and, then, Bill Murray, and then Bill Murray drank the Beaky 17 at the top of the rooftop and lost in translation. And everyone went mental and started drinking that. And they can't, and that's what you're saying. They, they can't use, they haven't got enough stock to provide age statements. This is why we're drinking Habiki Harmony Nika from the barrel. Um, and that's the interesting thing. It's like, otherwise there might not be Japanese whiskey because it's so exclusive and so limited at the moment, talking single malt, uh, sorry, um, age statements on Japanese whiskey. It's what is going to happen? That's exactly what you're saying. Yeah. We've got some really interesting comments as well. So one from you and Shivas Regal has a whiskey called Mizunara, which is stored in the Jap Japanese oak from Japan. I've got a bottle that's gorgeous. Yeah, that is a really wonderful one to explore. I love Adam's comment. It being from Japan adds more intrigue. It's time to do more research and tasting of Japanese whiskey. Yes. And this is what we love with Pour and Sip. Like we're introducing you to stuff that we're excited about for all kinds of different reasons. Um, and if it piques your interest, do go and explore. This is about a journey of discovery and it's awesome. Absolutely. I mean, I, I love, there is a level, exactly what Adam said, there's a level of intrigue when the Japanese do something because they're such masters at doing things and creating. And whiskey is one of those things that they really have perfected over there. The master blenders over there are just so kind of creative and they've really changed what blending whiskey actually is. Um, and then you just think of things like the beautiful bottle designs that we see in Japan, like the Hibiki bottle, which I think is just yes. one of the most stunningly designed. And it's got facades in it for each kind of year of the Japanese seasons. It's just a really stunning, all the Nika from the barrel, which is meant to be like an ice block. It's really, really clever, innovative stuff that only the Japanese really do. And they do it so, so well. So there is a level of intrigue when it comes to Japanese products and Japanese whiskey. Um, yeah. So yeah. So true. Right, so that's our Japanese dram for the evening, which I really enjoyed exploring and it was so much fun. Um, I am going to bring in Steph.
and say hi very briefly and then potter off until I'll be back later on because we're going to have a chat with Steph about all things whiskey and whiskey industry at the end. But here she is. Hey, Steph, how goes? Hello, very good, thanks. How are you guys? Yeah, all good. So I'm going to leave you in Andy's capable hands and he is going to chat all things Indian whiskey with you and I will dram along and really enjoy myself. Excellent. Bye, Christy. Everyone say bye to Christy. Bye. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> Um, Adrian, just let you know, I'll ask Chris that, but we, we will get on to that um, when we talk um, back again about the um, Japanese whiskey. Um, we'll just discuss the Indian one first now, so as, as Steph is here with us, and then we'll get back to the other drams, and I'll save that question for the end. Um, hello, Steph, how are you? Very good, thank you. Pleased to be here. Yeah, so we have Stephanie with us, who is the UK brand ambassador for Amrut. That's right. Absolutely. And we're going to be discussing Indian whiskey, which is yes. super We've just been to Japan. We're now going to India. And as someone said in the comments earlier, Indian whiskey, who knew? So exactly. This I've been is reading this, some of the comments. <laughs> yeah, it is, exactly. So for anyone who hasn't tried Indian whiskey before, I mean, that's, you know, it's it's really something that we've not been, you know, that is, is new on the scene, essentially. Um, and talk to us about Indian whiskey, because back, I mean, India is, unless I'm wrong, is the biggest drinker, actually, of whiskey. In, in, in the world, not per capita, but by population. And Indian whiskey tended to be made out from molasses back in the day and wasn't of high quality. Um, so talk to us a bit about the history of Indian whiskey in that respect. I, I will, but just two seconds, because if anyone is trying to uh, sip uh, the Amrit now, straight after that Mars that they've just had, that, that Mars is quite light, quite elegant, quite gentle. This next one's a bit of a beast, okay? So do take it slowly. Teeny tiny sip will get you in there nicely, I think, just to, just to warn you in case anyone's taking a... And also, I, I've poured mine already. I do recommend pouring. We'll give it a bit of air, a bit of time to kind of sit um, whilst me and Steph talk a bit. It, like Steph was saying, if you do want to start drinking, please feel free. But this is a very <laughs> different whiskey to the one we've just tried, which is a much, you know, let's say an elegant kind of whiskey. This is much more kind of, you know... It's a bigger whiskey, a more bold it's whiskey. Bigger, and it's 50% ABV, so you will definitely feel it being a bit more intense, a bit more kind of spicy, a bit more, it will say hello, it'll be a bit more friendly, um, yeah. but just give it a chance. Um, don't, yeah. don't be scared of it. Just take a tiny sip, introduce yourself slowly, and it'll be all right. Um, but yes, good point. So Indian whiskeys are some of the hugest whiskey uh, kind of producers and drinkers in the world. Um, I think it was seven out of the top 10 selling whiskey brands in the world a few years ago were all made in India, but they're also all drunk in India because they could be exported. Um, to export uh, anything, you have to f abide not only by your own laws as a country for what the thing is. So whiskey laws in India are, are quite loose as they used to be in Japan. Um, and uh, But whiskey laws, say, in the UK or Europe are very strict because we make a lot of whiskey and we want to control what it is. So if you go to India and drink whiskey, you may or may not be drinking what we would call uh, whiskey. Um, but if you're drinking it in the UK or buying it in the UK, it has to be uh, kind of produced according to what the, the rules of whiskey, as far as we understand them. So, um, so yes, there's a lot of whiskeys. I think is the easiest way to describe them in India. Um, I'm not sure if you've been over. I've um, I've been and drunk a few times. There was some very interesting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I went to Mumbai and I tried some what I thought they were calling whiskey, and it was very interesting. It tasted more like rum to me. Yeah. Yeah. They use tons and tons of sugarcane, and obviously India is quite hot, particularly in the south, so you do grow a lot of sugarcane, they make a lot of spirit from that, and they'll just add some colouring and some flavouring, Might be get lucky. you might be lucky to get a bit of malt spirit in there as well, um, but that is the vast majority of Indian whiskies. The one that we're trying now, in case you are trying it, is a single malt, it does adhere to all the rules um, of the UK for what a single malt needs to be. And it's the first, right, from India, Amrit were the first, to kind That's of abide by those rules. That's right. Uh, so these guys were the first uh, guys to, to make a sort of accredited single malt um, from India. So there's a couple of other companies doing it now, uh, but these guys sort of led the way. Their company had been making whiskey for a long time. They still make a whiskey, and that's kind of essentially what's funding the, co the company. Um, they, they actually set up uh, their distillery in 1948, uh, which is the year after India became independent. So it's a bit of an interesting history because, you know, part of colonizing somewhere and sorry all the British people I am one um here but you know part of the reason of having a colony is to sell them your stuff you want exports um your com your country makes more money when you export lots of things so part of taking over a colony is to make them like your stuff but don't let them make it themselves so um when we were in charge of India 
we encouraged them to like whiskey quite strongly, but we didn't really want them to make it. And so um, that was kind of how it was. There were people apparently making it. There's no records. It's all a bit hard to fathom uh, what was going on because you couldn't really, um, you know, disclose it. Um, but yes, this distillery uh, set up in 1948, the year after independence. So as soon as we were out of there, they were like, woohoo, quick. We're doing that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We like this stuff. Uh, like we don't want to buy it from them. They've gone now. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so talk, so talk to us about the series. Yanis, so, uh, uh, Yanis, sorry, I'm so sorry if I can't pronounce your name. It's embarrassing of me. Uh, mm -hmm. It's saying, is the distillery in New Delhi? Um, the distillery is in Bangalore? That's right. So sort of South Middle is quite far. I mean, if you look at a map of India, it doesn't look like that far, but it's hugely, hugely far um, uh, away from, from Delhi. So yeah, it's a good few hour flight if you want to get down to Bangalore. Um, so yes, so they started off actually these guys at this distillery making uh, brandy and making rum because again, south they're in the south, so it's very hot. Barley doesn't grow very well down there, but they grow a lot of uh, fruit and sugar cane. So they started off by making whiskey and uh, sorry, brandy and rum just to get get some money, get you know get themselves going, having built a new distillery. And then in the 1980s started uh, distilling uh, barley. And the barley is really interesting because it comes from India and it's different from the stuff that we grow in Europe. Okay, and we're talking about that the barley that they use is very different to the barley that we, the Scottish, will use. For example, in Scottish history, we're talking about the difference between six row barley and two row barley. Okay, yes, and in that's... India, they use six row barley. Yes, and that's actually the kind of ancient version of the grain. So we've spent the last couple of thousand years in Europe unnaturally selecting for our barley to give us this higher yield. So if you think of a stalk of barley, um, you end up with two rows of grains on it in Europe. And that means each grain has plenty of room to grow nice and fat. Um, and it's the inside bit of the barley that you want to get. That's your it gives us your starch and that will give you eventually your sugar, which will give you eventually your alcohol. So um, you want the grain to be nice and fat. You don't get too many of them, but they gives you tons and tons of the starch. What they grow in India is the ancient version of the grain. It's not been kind of modified at all. Um, and it's a six row barley. So for each stalk of grain, you have six rows of grain on there. Um, so if you count them, you're like, woohoo, we've got three times as many, but that's not helpful <laughs> because each grain is really small. And so you've got much less of the middle and a higher proportion of husk. During fermentation, husk though creates tons of flavor. And so that means that using this type of barley is, um, is dreadful for yields, but really, really good for giving you a fully flavored uh, whiskey. And isn't often used in, for example, in Scotland, you would they, they wouldn't use this, or in America, for example, where they may add malted barley as kind of 20% of a bourbon mash bill, for instance, so they might not need such a high yield, so they can use the two-row barley, but it's obviously very different in India. Yeah, if anyone's had anything made from what's called bear barley in Scotland, B-E-R-E, -E, um, that's the same stuff, that's the six-row barley. So growing it in Orkney, um, I've been to a mill that mills it in Orkney, uh, specifically, and then had bread, I've got flour in the cupboard actually made from this bear barley. So it is coming back in a wee bit. Brew glad to do a wonderful bear barley. That is a yeah, I think Aaron did one as well. Um, so yeah, yeah, a few people have done them. Um, um, so that's the same stuff. Chloe, we'll get on to this, that, that question, which cocktails can you make with this whiskey? Um, we'll talk about the whiskey first and then we can discuss that. Uh, a lot of people are already trying it. So let's just discuss oh, the actual dram as well now, very briefly before you guys, we, we get into trying it. Amra well, Fusion. So yes. what is in this? So we're discussing another oh. blended <laughs> malt, essentially. Well, not really, because a, a single malt, by definition, is from one distillery, and this has all been distilled at one distillery. So it um, it is technically a single malt, um, but the barley has come from two different yeah, places, and that's the kind of fusion part. Um, so when they started making the whiskey um, from the Indian barley, they were trying to make peated and unpeated versions. And unpeated was nice and easy, but peated was a bit hard. There is peat in India, but it's made from different plants compared to Scotland. And it tastes a wee bit different when you burn it. Also, Amrit don't have their own maltings. They're using a commercial maltings in Delhi, um, who don't really love the idea of burning a bunch of random plant matter on the floor <laughs> while they're malting um, in the middle of their week. Um, might affect the flavor of everything else. So. Um, I'm, you know, they had a few options how to make some peated, some peated uh, whiskey. And obviously, you know, they could have this lovely Indian barley that tastes completely different. They wanted to malt that themselves. But, you know, building a maltings, learning how to malt, it's quite expensive. It's quite time consuming. It's quite fiddly. So shall we do that? Shall we not? Um, you know, we, shall we send, you know, get peat from Scotland and try and make this maltings do it? There's all kinds of ways, ways that they try to do it. And they realized actually the simplest kind of was the, the best option, which was 
Scotland's already got tons of malt houses malting barley and peating it to a nice consistent level. They've got tons of experience. They're very good at it. Um, and so they ship over the peated component from Scotland. So there's space side malting. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And also, we, we, we should quickly discuss, but again, before we go into the, the um, <laughs> so India, the climate is extremely, what would say, well, it's very different to Scotland, but much more, much hotter climate. And when we're talking about maturation for spirit within the cask, obviously, we in Corinth, we've, we've had Australian whiskey and we've had Kentucky whiskey, which has similar kind of things. But I suppose that in India, the evaporation from the cask and the angel share, as we call it, which is the amount of spirit essentially that is lost from the cask, is quite dramatic. It's terrifying, actually. And I mean, it, it's aging three to four times faster than it would do in Scotland. And so you're thinking, you know, it's one and a half to two percent angel share in Scotland. So it's aging four times faster. We'd expect four times two. Uh, eight percent angel share to be fair yeah so you're, so you're like okay this is this is what we're expecting amrit at 12 to 16 percent a year <laughs> so you're like what which what is but, happening um, here that is, yeah which is apt as it's kind of i mean and i'm sure it's even maybe less than that well, i don't know what it is in kentucky do you do you know kentucky is about four four and a half percent um so because kentucky has much colder winters whereas uh in india they're having the hot summers just like kentucky but they're not having the cold winters so coldest kind of night hotter, hot hotter yeah. and hotter than india Yes, I mean, coldest night in kind of Bangalore, it's 3,000 feet above sea level, so it is it is a bit at altitude. Um, but, you know, it's going from sort of 40 degrees in the summer to, I mean, you'd be lucky if you get sort of 12 degrees cool night in winter. And that's a Scottish summer, isn't it? So, you know, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's this, very this different. This the process up of maturation. So essentially, a, a three-year-old, you'll, you'll get a 12-year-old Scottish whiskey could be the equivalent of a four-year-old, three-year-old Indian whiskey. Um, so it's very favorable conditions to mature whiskey and spirit, sorry, as it's not whiskey yet, in those conditions. Yeah, unless you're counting the angel share. And so I, I meet a lot of people when I'm doing tastings, I tell them about the speed of aging and they're like, oh, I'm an entrepreneur, I'll build a distillery in this lovely hot climate and I'll make some whiskey and this is a genius idea. And then you talk about the angel share and you're like, mm, no, it's actually, it costs about the same amount of money so the joke in uh, amrit is uh they always sort of say you know our angel share is super high but we've got way more gods so yeah. you know of course we have more angels like, okay, oh, and, right, and, and, and amrit is sanskrit for nectar of the gods or elixir that's of the right world. yeah okay. there's a story um where a bunch of gods had a fight and the sea god got injured and he went off and found this um kind of plant that gave him this juice um that he drank and it healed him so yeah that's <laughs> I'm ready. That's, that's great. Uh, if anyone has a look, I, I recommend going on YouTube and looking at a little distillery tour. There's a great uh, distillery tour on whiskey.com. It is so amazing to watch. It's just so Indian and so kind of crazy, absolute chaos it looks like there. But it's it just, and I'm hoping we can try that in the in, in the dram. So just get into your tasting notes first, guys, because me and Steph have been talking for quite a while now, <laughs> and you guys have come up with serious tasting notes. Okay. If I don't get to your, your, your comments, Neil Bolton, Fruity and Treacle Toffee. Uh, El Sutton, that first honey and oak. Now I'm getting tropical fruit. David Platt, plenty of smoke and more. Ian Jambo rain, quite subtle smoke, sweet and creamy. What is the percentage of the peated barley from Scotland in comparison to the Indian barley in this drought? 20%. And so it's malted to 25 to 30 ppm, and then it's 20% of the total components. This is 80% unpeated Indian barley, and then 20% peated, we call it European barley to be safe, because obviously not all Scottish malt houses are able to only buy Scottish barley. So Yeah. Mike Pizarro, this is my first Indian whiskey. Really looking forward to this. Well done to the young try, George. Yeah, you've waited for the, for the <laughs> all my Indian yes. whiskey drinkers. Yes. Uh, David Platt, just morphing into tropical fruit and finish. Green, oh, David Platt's already on the finish. Right. So we have a, let's have a nose of it ourselves. Steph. Yeah. Um, so like I said, it's quite big. And um, and it, people, as you said, you know, this, the peat isn't, you know, it's not like some of the islas where it's, um, you know, it's yelling at you from across the road. It's, it's, you know, it is a gentle smokiness, but there's definitely a lot of flavor on here. It's a bit of a boom up on the palate. Um, so, you know, lots and lots of kind of, obviously it's, it's Asian American oak, I should have said, sorry. It's um, ex bourbon browse, a little bit of virgin oak in here as well. It's aged for five and a half years in that heat. So this is really the equivalent of an 18 plus scotch essentially. So if anyone's getting those kind of, um, you know, big aging kind of flavors coming through, that's, that's because of that. Um, so, yeah, and then the fruitiness and then the maltiness as well. Um, I think for me, the maltiness is a texture thing. Um, so look out for that Indian barley on, on the palate and the texture. Yeah, I mean, is, is there a kind of characteristic of Indian whiskey, like an, or is there a distillery character of Amrit in particular? 
um, that we could look out for in this dram? Yeah, so it is always that maltiness. And again, it's that that Indian barley, you know, you really taste the barley compared to people using the, the two-year-old barley. Um, so um, it's, it's common through, you know, the Brickladdy Bear barley or whoever else has used it. It, it kind of you get that. Um, I sort of joke about the unbeated version of this, that, you know, when you've had a bowl of cereal and then at the end of the cereal is the milk that tastes of cereal. That's it. Uh, yeah. That's it. <laughs> and so that's the flavor and texture for me that you get from this uh, six row barley is um, it's kind of a creamy texture, but combined with that cereal note. Uh, and it's it's definitely woven all through this. And, you know, I love how well integrated the smoke in this is because um, it's, it's a solid smokiness, but it's not, you know, trying to make your eyes bleed it's just no, this, is, this isn't an isla kind of as we tried the kiloman the other the other week let's let's have a let's have a sip cheers everybody and then we yeah, can get cheers. Questions. and if you do have any questions for steph about the distillery please let us know and i'll get them to you yes there's tons to talk about actually sorry i'm trying to talk really fast um, <laughs> just to get through, just to get through all of it um but yes yeah, so um these guys launched their first single mots in 2004 and actually did the launch event in glasgow um, which is kind of a, you know, a bit like bringing it to, to the home. Um, so they did a blind tasting. It was their, three of their malts versus three Scottish malts. And, you know, could anyone tell the difference? And if they didn't, that was seen as success. And, and it worked. It was brilliant. No one, um, no one could guess which ones are Indian. And, um, yeah, it made a lot of news in those days. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like, for me, it's like there's a bit of a space side kind of sweetness to it, but then a highland kind of spiciness to it. Um, as well and then obviously you've got the peat here it's like a tangy peat for me it's not like a kind of isla kind of iodine type of peat it's like kind of a tangy ashy kind of peat for me yeah and i think it's much more herbaceous as well because it's coming from that spayside maltings um it's not going to be the sort of coastal peats uh, there it is coming um the more heathery you know, from... kind of peat that you exactly so richard berry asking a question which kind of warehouse is that uh, palletized or dunnage well, they have palletized, but they actually have a variety. So they've they doubled, um, although they tripled their production um, facilities. Uh, I'm gonna I keep saying last year, but it was actually the year before. Uh, now uh, we're in February, and um, they have been rapidly trying to build warehouses um, up. After that, uh, they're now building their eighth warehouse, and their seventh is full, and everything's full, and they're having to use kind of old office buildings because some people are on furlough, and there's like a random. Um, uh sort of cellar underneath their bottling line that they've started putting casks into and stuff as well so um really because it's <laughs> yeah because it's so hot over there the the, the dunnage warehouse style wouldn't really work um obviously that's all about humidity um and actually i, I mentioned about the heat but the uh 3, feet above sea level this guy this area is super dry so what we're having during aging rather than the abv go down as you get in scotland you get it like Kentucky where the ABV goes up during aging. Um, so this will go into casks sort of 65 to 63 to 68, depending how where it's come off the still um, and then come out higher, um, which obviously is super unusual when you're looking at single malts. So they sort of joke about the aging being halfway between Scottish style and, and American style. Okay. There's some seriously great tasting notes. coming. Everyone is loving this, by the way. Uh, right. David, welcome punch. Holy moly, Mike Pizarro, this is gorgeous. Michael Smith, cardamom notes. Now, I get those as well, and I didn't know if it was because I was just associating that because it was Indian, but when I was trying this beforehand, that was the, I, I, I did think to myself about cardamom. Is that, yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I, you know, I try not to, again, lean into the spice too heavily at the beginning because it does sound, I mean, like, are we heading towards racism? You know, like, oh, God, yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, um, but, um, yeah, there's definite cardamom notes here. And actually, I've done, you know, a few food pairings. And sorry for um, Christy, she's at least eaten um, before today. But um, the food pairings I've done with this, obviously, I'll do them in places where we sell Amrit. And quite often, uh, Indian restaurants love selling it. And, you know, this, if you've got a really creamy sort of butter chicken um, or korma type thing, this is absolutely incredible with that. So apologies That's to anyone who's good. hungry. Mm. But not with, a, not with a madras or something quite spicy. Don't go spicy. Spicy plus alcohol, bad. Um, but if yeah, you go creamy... <laughs> Very simple equation for everyone. Spicy plus alcohol, bad. Yes. Uh, saying India one, Japan nil. Oh, this is oh. a <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget there are very many whiskies. It's what, what you prefer tonight. But I mean, obviously Japan, the breadth of whiskey and India is kind of... I mean, we've got three main distilleries that are doing single malt kind of whiskey. We've got Rampa um, and Paul John. Paul John as well. That's yeah. right. Um, so, I mean, they're all from different states as well. So the thing about in India, the states 
all have the it's kind of against the law to transport alcohol between the states so if you're in delhi for example uh, amrit's made in bangalore if you try and find amrit there it's super hard and what they have to do to get it to delhi would be export it pay all the tax in whatever third country they're using and then bring it back in to delhi and re-import it to india and pay the tax then as well so it ends up being tons more expensive than um you know a, a scotch so single one yeah. Are, they, are, they, are those distilleries like you know obviously in scotland some you know distilleries like to help each other out and stuff like that does that happen in india with these three distilleries i think they all set up very separately um i don't think they're really competitors because again most of yeah. amrit in india would be sold in karnataka which is the state that bangalore is in uh paul john's in goa so they wouldn't really cross over you won't really find paul john in karnataka you probably won't find amrit much in uh, in goa so um you know they and it's such a huge distance as well so you know different space side distilleries helping each other out um you know it's because it's only <laughs> 10 minutes down the road yeah, from each other is yeah. this is uh super far so i mean we have done tastings with them before uh, with the other brands in the uk just to sort of introduce people to the to the category um and uh, you know they're all delicious and everyone's making kind of you know really really good stuff um but you know you just don't get to see it kind of all together very often um i think yeah. you know one or two indian whiskies in a tasting sometimes people are a bit like surprised that it's there in the first place never mind having an entire indian taste indian whiskey tasting evening uh your uncle vanya absolutely loving it anyone getting salty licorice i can't get it out of my head now yes. David, lovely reminds me of late evening bowl of cheerios you have cheerios <laughs> in the evening wow <laughs> that uh, was uh, like a treat if you're a kid i think it's a treat yeah it's absolutely anna dylan still strong with pepper notes even after a bit of water joe f this is such an unusual whiskey i'm not a fan of it on the nose but it tastes fantastic absolutely Ian Turner must try Korma and whiskey. What a combination. Uh, yeah. I agree with tasting notes regarding milky coffee, but slightly spicy towards end, which lingers on for some time. Uh, yeah, there is, a, there's kind of a, a bit of the smokiness kind of lingers a bit on the tongue as well towards the end mm. of the finish. Uh, but I mean, it's, it's really creamy on the palate, kind of the arrival that when it first gets there, and I'm getting lots of tropical kind of banana as well. Yeah, and that's something you're getting from the tropical aging. Um, mm. So, you know, an American at cask, you know, you usually sort of say, um, you know, if anyone, if you, any brands tells you they're Asian American oak, you know, just say vanilla, maybe say some some sort of gentle spices, say chocolate and toffee. Those are the flavors you get from American oak. But if you take that same type of cask into a hot climate, it starts giving you grilled pineapple, it gives you coconut, it gives you all these tropical notes. So there's definitely a link to aging in the hot climate and the flavors you're getting from a cask. That's super, super interesting. Roger Lewis, my favorite. Sorry, Japan. <laughs> <laughs> I think this one's probably winning tonight. Uh, Adam Pounds, love the sting and tingle left in the mouth after a swell. High ABV. Yeah, I mean, what do you think about this? Would you, I mean, a, a couple of, I don't, haven't added water to this. I expect that maybe a couple of drops of water might be able to, you know, open it up even more. Absolutely. And it really, it really does work. And I think it depends on your palate. Like, I think you and I drink a, a bit of whiskey, um, I'm going to say, quite a lot during the day. <laughs> so, I drink, you know, you know, you're doing tastings and samples. Yeah. And very different. <laughs> so for me, 40% is zero. You know, that's where my default level starts. So this being 50, this is just like 10% alcohol. It doesn't feel very strong. But for a lot of people who are used to drinking maybe beer or wine uh, more regularly and sipping spirits is something you do less often, then this is going to feel pretty strong. So yeah, absolutely open up the water. Um, so, I mean, I think whenever you're tasting a whiskey, if the, the flavor you're getting from the alcohol is more intense than the flavor you're getting, uh, then you need a wee bit of water and it's it'll be different on different days it'll depend on what you've had for lunch and, and how you're feeling so the weather yeah. outside what yeah. you've done there, how stressed you are uh, actually very interesting i thought alcohol is frowned upon in india i'm very surprised to find such a good indian whiskey oh, yeah, um, not in the south only in the north so where they grow <laughs> the barley the barley all comes from the punjab and rajasthan region and it's the foothills of the himalayas because like i say barley doesn't grow well in the south but in the north um foothills of the himalayas obviously it's much cooler temperature up there um, and that is where this barley oil grows. And it's, it's known as the bread basket of India. They grow tons and tons, absolute tons of grain um, up there. And, um, but those states are usually uh, more likely to be dry. So they can't build a distillery. Because when I was talking to them initially about it, I was like, why have you put the distillery in? Why have you put the distillery down there? They're from there, they're from Bangalore. So that's why the distillery is there, they're farmers. Um, and it's on their farmland and they've got a lovely um, you know, aquifer uh, giving them nice fresh water. So that's why they put the distillery there. But if you were thinking about building a distillery in India, you go, well, I'm going to build it near the grain if I can. The climate's more like Scotland and it'll be everything will be a bit easier. But yeah, no alcohol allowed up there. So don't. <laughs> but it's, uh, essentially, they weren't trying to necessarily just exactly copy Scottish kind of production and make kind of, a, 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 you know, a kind of Scot replica. It's really focusing on kind of Indian barley yeah. now, which is really, really interesting. 
Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so they have just, like I say, recently expanded, and it's really interesting. They've kept the shapes of the stills. Uh, they've just replicated the stills exactly. Uh, but now they've got three pairs rather than just one pair. So they used to do about 300,000 litres of alcohol per year, and now it's 900. So uh, really exciting. Like I say, just rapidly trying to build these warehouses. And what percentage of the series output is single malt now? Um, so the, there's, they, they're not, this isn't counting the stuff that they, they still make rum, they still make brandy, they still make some malt spirit for their local Indian whiskey. Um, so that's not counting that. Um, but that's all separate stills. They keep okay. it in a different place. Yeah. Just some more before, because we're, we're talking about, we're, we're going to have to kind of let Christy <laughs> yeah, wrap, wrap this up. No, no, it's, it's great. There's just, there's so many questions and this is your last chance to get questions in for Steph before, <laughs> uh, before we um, wrap up. Uh, um, this is fascinating, says Adrian, but really grown on me as a whiskey and the info and trading on India. Thank you very much. David Statton, spicy coffee. I can't believe I'm drinking whiskey from India. That's what we're all about at Pour and Sip. You're absolutely, we're taking you on a journey around the world, literally. Uh, Jack Finney, bowl of Cheerios with mango lassi poured on top. Oh, that sounds delicious. Ed Gamble, love how it attacks the gums. Uh, it's this actually my... goes great with a mango lassi. Um, oh, I have I done love that tasting lassi. also. Yeah. Jacob Island, it's now my life goal to have 40% and call it 0%. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Colin Bell actually says, any plans for a heavily peated version? I mean, there is a, there is a, a more There is version. a peated version, that's right. So uh, so this is part of the range of three that we call sort of Amrit standard range. And there's one that's just called Amrit single malt, and that is 100% unpeated Indian barley. And then there's Amrit peated, which is 100% of the European peated barley. So it's much more smoky. There's also a cask strength version of that, which if you like your big peatiness and actually weirdly tastes a wee bit coastal, a little bit maritime, which coming from nowhere, because I'm, you know, Bangalore is nowhere near the sea, need the space side. So really interesting. Um, and then there's a fusion, which is the sort of two together at the a bit older. So the, the two sort of standard ones are, are um, four years old, four and a half years old. And this one's five and a half years old. So this one's um, the combo and a bit older. But there's lots of other exciting things coming out. So they've just... Um, uh, about to launch um, India's and probably Asia's first triple distilled whiskey. So like the Irish are making it, so it's, it's coming soon, hopefully. Um, and then they do all kinds of other uh, real, f Amrit, whenever they do something experimental, they're, they're, they're super playful about it, to be honest. They did one called Spectrum a few years ago, um, which I think is coming out, another version coming out this year. But um, they took apart five different cask types. So they had a new American oak, a used, uh, and used um, sherry cask, uh, new French oak and used French oak and took staves from each of those and made one cask out of it, uh, alternating wow. the staves. Yeah. Um, and then put different ends on as well and aged it in that. And it was absolutely incredible. But you know, super we, got, we got like eight bottles for the UK. Um, so yeah. whenever the Amra do a limited release, it's very, yeah. very limited. Um, it goes like really the, fast. Uh, really the greedy angel share bottle that was. Actually yes, <laughs> that's right. And those, so that's, that's the other release that might be coming later in the year is one they call greedy angels. It's the oldest Indian whiskey. Uh, ever made so they started off with a 10 year old a few years ago then they did a 12 year old a couple of years ago so um, i think it might be another 12 coming soon two questions before we go uh, going. jane mackintosh where do they get their water from you had previously explained that yeah so they're in a bunch of farming lands just outside bangalore so not in the city center obviously um but uh, yeah they've got an aquifer uh, on the land so it's um you know really pure water coming from under a, a kind of a shelf uh sort of like an underground lake type of thing that's awesome uh, Chloe Moss repeated the question. Cocktails. Uh, would you what cocktails? Well, yes. I think okay. Like so in for me with this maybe it's like a kind really of kind good of shout. Now, actually, the few years ago, this is a fun question. So a few years ago, there's a bunch of bartenders in America, a big New York bartending magazine, uh, asked bartenders to make Manhattan's with all the whiskeys they could think of, and this one won. Um, so yeah, it's it absolutely smashes a Manhattan. I mean, there is a rice spiciness kind of, well, maybe it's the spiciness that you would normally associate with American rye, maybe that's kind of coming through on this whiskey that maybe makes it work in a Manhattan. Yeah, exactly. And the smokiness that you don't usually get in a Manhattan, it's beautiful. So if anyone's not sure, do a couple of shots of this with, you know, just around half a shot to one shot, depending how you're feeling, of uh, red vermouth or sweet vermouth. Um, and then a little bit of bitters. If that's I'm going to ask you one more question. Sorry, Christy, before they come back. Adrian Carr, are Amrit considering using any cast types for maturation? Well, I, I assume they, you mean, yeah. Yeah, they do that already, actually. So the, the standard range, like I say, is unpeated, peated, and the fusion. And then they also do um, some port casks and some sherry casks. Now, the fun thing, and sorry, this is taking too long, um, but the fun thing that they do is European oak does not play nicely in the heat. So if you ship over a sherry cask, Unlike American oak, it doesn't give you different flavours. It just goes real bitter, real fast. 
Um, so what they have to do is what I call the sandwich method. So they age the whiskey first for three and a half to four years in next bourbon. Uh, then they put it into the sherry or the port cask for a year. And then they'll put it back into the American oak for another year, year and a half. Um, and that just softens out and rounds all the flavors and makes everything balanced. So you got um, American, then sherry or port, and then American again. So hence why I call it the sandwich. The sherry or port is essentially jam. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they've done, a, they've done a Madeira cask. It's actually the red box behind me. So that's kind of one that's out at the moment. Sherry, it's been a wee while since we've had a sherry and a port. Um, port went airports only uh, recently, but I think it might be coming back. So uh, keep an eye out. Oh, Madeira cask sounds lovely. It's a huge fan of Springbank just did a wonderful Madeira cask, which is one of my favourite whiskey I've tried recently. Anyway, I digress. Um, <laughs> I'm going to say we're going to bring Christy back now, as a, and we can wrap up a bit. Hello, welcome back, oh, Christy. Hi. Well, what a treat was that? I mean, I've got the tiniest <laughs> bit left. I've been like nosing and tasting along. Um, thank you so much for chatting us through it all, Steph. My pleasure. Sorry, it's like I say, tons to say. So trying to um, get as much information out as I can without breathing. Oh, no, it's perfect. I mean, also, I feel like I've had an education in how to eat Cheerios as well as an aside, which is <laughs> also good. Um, I have a question for you, actually, before we round up. I know everyone else has, has got the questions in, and please do continue to join, join in the conversation. You are a woman who actually wears many hats. So Amra isn't the only brand you work for, and you've got a bit of a take on the whole Japanese whiskey thing, right? That's right. Uh, you mentioned it earlier. Actually, I work with Nika uh, for the UK as well. Um, so, yes, yeah, it's been quite interesting. Um, Obviously, the thing I think a lot of people don't realize is that the Japanese whiskey producers have all been part of creating this set of guidelines. So, you know, Nika was involved, I think it's been involved quite a few years and, and obviously working with all the other suppliers to work on what they think is acceptable or not. Um, and I know why you're saying that Nika didn't didn't talk about it very much before, but they, they don't actually write Japanese whiskey on the, the, the label, on the bottle for Nika from the barrel. And um, it's not the same as sort of disclosing it, but they were, you know, they did talk about it if people kind of asked specifically. Um, the thing with blending, I think that people don't realize is your blend components are gonna change. You're making a blend, it needs to taste like this final result today. Then next year or in three months time, you make you wanna make that same blend and it needs to taste the same, but you've run out of blend, you know, whiskey number 30, whiskey number 45 and whiskey, let's say is a hundred in the blend. Uh, whiskey number 47, whiskey number 83. And so on that time, you'll find some other whiskies that taste the same as you need them to taste and put them in. But then the next time, that might be completely different again. So disclosing what's in a blend is sometimes really hard because you'd be like, well, which which batch are you tasting? What was in this? Um, so I think Nika, you know, have always been very much focused on the art of blending. Um, Takitsuri, of course, who set up Nika, you know, was in Scotland. He's the guy who brought uh, the kind of how to make how to make whiskey back to Japan. He taught Japan how to make whiskey, and obviously had really close connections to Scotland, having been there, having married a Scottish lady. Um, so yeah, I think it's you know Nika's focus has always been the resulting flavour, um, and you know is it delicious? Is it not delicious? And what what goes into it today to make it delicious is what's necessary to make it delicious. What goes into it next battery make is what's necessary then. So Could they release Nika from the barrel in batches, probably not. Yeah, no, it'd be pretty hard. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, it would be pretty difficult. I mean, I think it is, like, I think it is tiny quantities. Um, but of course, like I say, it's just hard to say. And, you know, some bottles you buy, it might be even more than the next one. So it's it's really, really hard for them to sort of disclose what's going in there because the, the whole thing is a fluid situation. Um, yeah. So some bottles of Nika from the barrel you might have got might have been 100% Japanese. But because they can't guarantee that it always is, that mm -hmm. is why you've got to be careful. Yeah. Guys, before we wrap up, we carry on this talk. Uh, let us know what your favourite dram was from the box overall in February. Now, I know Steph's here, but, you know, uh, <laughs> Steph wears many hats, so she might have already uh, represented one of the other brands, as we were going to say, so don't worry too much <laughs> if it wasn't the uh, the Amra. Uh, but do let us know which your favourite one that you tried this month has been, if you've been with us for both tastings. Uh, yes. And anyway, so, so we were saying. Yeah. Yeah, and I think you were saying about, um, you know, the, the three year sort of delay as well, it's quite interesting. No one has to do any of this, um, you know, labeling or, or kind of follow any of the rules for it for another three years after it's announced. So I think the fact that everyone's trying to work towards it, you know, it's a sign of goodwill, it's a sign of, um, you know, everyone trying to, um, you know, now that they've all agreed what it is and what it should be um, is, well, now that we feel like we should be, you know, 
let, let's talk about it all. So this is pretty interesting. Um, but I think it's a great step for Japanese whiskey. And um, like I say, Nika have been you know, so on the ball. Uh, their website changed immediately. Um, all the information coming out changed immediately. So it's, you know, there we go. Let's keep it clear. Yeah. I have to say that even with my journalist hat on, I was first aware of the big changes with Nika's statement, right? So it wasn't like it was an announcement that was snuck out under the radar. It was like, this has happened. This is what we're doing. Everyone can know we're not hiding anything, um, which I think is also a really important thing to say. Yeah, and I think obviously it has been happening for a few years, um, the, the decisions of what they're going to make in, into the rules. But also in those few years, you know, there's been all the shortages, all the everything else that's been going on. So again, the situation has been super difficult of, um, of knowing what's in stock when and knowing what's happening. So I think, um, you know, doing it a couple of years ago when everything, you know, there's a bunch of, a bunch of different waves of discontinuation would have been really hard as well. So I think, you know, now that we're at a stage when, you know, the range is pretty solid, the news is out, everyone's agreed, I think it's the perfect time to kind of um, make everything clear. Definitely. And just while everyone's still deciding what their favorite drams <laughs> are, um, I just wanna give everyone a little sneak peek for what's coming up next month. So we've already had a very vitally important question from Ian, who I'm gonna shout out. He's got his priorities right, I'm just gonna say. <laughs> when are the next two dates in March? I have a wine and cheese evening to organize and it's planned for the 18th, but I will change it depending on pour and sip dates. <laughs> Well, Wait, I, you, you're going to change all your plans because of the pour and sip tasting. That's exactly. So, um, yeah, star listener award to Ian just there. Um, pour and sip is always going to be on the first and third Thursday of the month. So you can literally mark your diaries up until Christmas. So the first and third Thursday, we're going to be here geeking out. We're going to do three drams on the first session, two drams on the second one. Keep your eyes peeled for your email um, for what we're going to taste when. But next month is really exciting. So March is always obviously Mother's Day. I um, mean, it's also International Women's Day. So all five drams next month, we're going to try and have a guest. So we have five guests for you. So it's going to be all kinds of chaos, which I'm here for. Um, and it's just going to be a celebration of women in the whiskey industry in honor of just, yeah, cool women in whiskey and mums and just, yeah, doing something a little bit different. So really excited. It's our first themed box. We're going to have other themes throughout the year. Not every month, don't panic. Um, but yeah, so you won't want to miss March. There's going to be loads of guests, action packed, can't wait. So it's going to be the 4th and the 18th. So yeah, be there, come and join us. Literally action packed, five guests. That is insane. That is, uh, I can't wait. <laughs> you guys yeah. will be juggling. Yeah. yeah, lots of juggling, but I really can't wait. I mean, we're just going to have to be really mean with our questions. We're like, wait, to the point, to the point. Um, but no, it's going to be good. So yeah, it's been so wonderful this evening to learn from no, you. No so. cheese tangents or uh, Cheerios and cereal tangents. <laughs> 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 yeah, I've been um, super lucky. I've had tons of time to chat. <laughs> some of, we've got all the, have you seen, we've got all the um, everyone's favourites rolling in. Amra, 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 says uh, Ian Turner. We've got some votes for Kilhoman, we've got a vote for Mars, we've got a vote for Tom and Tal, and I think the chick was last month's box. I, I've lost track, really. Yeah, it was. Um, <laughs> no, it was, it definitely was. We've got all kinds, we've got some votes for the Aaron. I think, yeah, the Amrut's doing really well. There's lots of joints between Tom and Tull and Amrut or Kilhoman and Amrut. So yeah, yeah, lots Amrit, and lots definitely. of votes Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it, how everyone's tastes, you know, you just five different drams and it literally, it, just judging by that, it's just that every single dram has had its fair representation of people who've liked it so, and, and chosen it as their favourite. So that is the sign of a good box, guys. Sign, sign of a good box. box. Well done. Exactly well, yeah, just not to be too salesy about it, but Mike said, if you want me to pick my favourite, I'll have to try them all again. Send another fed box. So um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure we've got some boxes in our pour and sip member shop, which don't forget about. So if you've loved a whiskey, you can get a bottle of it. And we've got like, like honestly, like exclusive prices for you in that member store. So don't go anywhere else. Go to the member store, get your bottle there. Um, and prices just for you. Yeah. 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 And yeah, I, think, I think that's probably us for now. <laughs> um, we've gone over again as well looking forward to trying the other three at the weekend well enjoy if you've saved any of your drams for the weekend then first of all you've got much more willpower than i have um but also make sure you enjoy them chill out with them have a wonderful time yeah we, we, we've gone over again i think uh, who was who said someone in the comments last the other time said that we should add these to an hour and a half instead of an hour <laughs> Yeah, we may have to. I mean, there's just too much good chat to go around. But yeah, honestly, Steph, thank you so much for coming and joining us. It's been so fascinating. I've loved learning. I feel like I've, yeah, just picked up yeah. so many good bits of knowledge from you. 
Thanks for having me. It's been absolutely delightful. Yes, thank you, Steph. And thank you, everybody. It's been a, it's been a wonderful uh, February's pour and sip box. It's been so much fun. the comments. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> so many comments. <laughs> so many comments. So many. And it's, yeah, it's been amazing to read them all. Um, thank you for tuning in, everyone. And we'll see you on the 4th for, well, more drams, more deliciousness. More deliciousness.